Welcome. This is uh, DevOps Leads the Way to Better Drupal Development. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about DevOps and your development and how DevOps is related to your development and how DevOps can improve your development. I'm going to talk to you about a conversation that the Drupal community has been having for several years now uh, that can be summed up pretty simply in this question, where is your repo? Um, I'm going to go through that argument um, and present, simplify it down to basically two sides. I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of each approach. And then I'm going to explore how we might actually not have to accept either of those approaches and come up with a third way um, that gets the best of both worlds. I'm going to walk through that, show some actual code of um, how it might be done, and time permitting, uh, go through a demo of some things I've been working on. So my name is Kevin Champion. I am an independent contractor and developer. I've been working in Drupal for about four years. Um, I prefer to be barefoot almost always. Uh, a little trivia fact about myself, I've now run, uh, successfully run and completed two marathons completely 100% barefoot. So I want you to think about your um, I want you to think about your typical Drupal site, your typical Drupal project. Um, if you have a lot of variance in the types of projects you end up doing and you do a lot of strange custom stuff, um, just uh, maybe focus on the last project that you did. So how many of you um, put your Git repo in your Drupal root like this picture shows? Raise your hands. How many of you is this typical practice? So you put your Git repo in your Drupal root, you track Drupal core, all the application files, all of your custom code, pretty much everything in there. Um, this uh, approach has many benefits and a few drawbacks, which I'll talk about in a minute. How many of you do something uh, a little bit more complicated, like this? So you set up a parent directory. Inside that parent directory, you have actually your Drupal root, which has um, Drupal core and all of your custom code. And you also have these other things. Um, it varies from project to project, but you have other things that you want to track in your repository. So you sort of take it one level up, and you put your Git repo in there, you track everything, and then Drupal root. Show of hands. All right, so that's not quite as much as the first one, but still quite a few. How many of you do something like this, where you'd put your Git repo for your site inside your sites directory, either covering all of your sites or just like one specific site? Show of hands. All right. Very few on that one. And lastly, how many of you put your repo inside of um, an install profile? So you set up an install profile as the container for your site, and your repo is in there. All right, even fewer. So this one's got the least. So DevOps is critical to development. This um, probably isn't news to you. But the way I mean this, I think, is a little bit different than the way this phrase might normally be interpreted. What I mean to say is DevOps is not separate from development. Um, it's not a uh, separate process that's just there to help with development. Um, it's not just something that you don't really worry about until you know, you've developed your site, um, client's pretty happy, and then, oh, we've got to do the DevOps stuff to get it to the place where it needs to be so that it can be deployed. It's not just deploying your code, your site from environment to environment. DevOps is farther down the stack than you might ordinarily think about it. I'm here to say that DevOps is critical to how you develop, to the very process with which you develop, to the nature of your development. And for this reason, where you put your repo is really, really important. One of the reasons why it's important, if we just sort of take a pause for a moment and think about Git, and this is really specific to Git. So this is something I've been reflecting upon. It's really amazing to think how much software in general has changed and the Drupal community along with it in a really short amount of time because of the creation of Git and the adoption of Git and how it's taken off. You can't really even imagine using other version control in most cases nowadays, which is quite remarkable. Um, Git itself, baked into the very way that it works, the very structure, the core of how it operates, it really has two fundamental purposes. You normally think, maybe you normally think about Git as source control, um, as, as change management. And that certainly is something that it excels at. But built into the way that it works and the way that Linus Torvalds built it was also sort of, you might think of it as a DevOps component. 
So Git is not just good for tracking changes, merging changes. Git's also really good for moving code from one place to another. Um, there's a really great video of Linus introducing Git in a Google talk in 2007 to Google to try and encourage them to use it. And in that talk, he describes what he had in mind when he was creating it and the team of, uh, of developers that, that were creating it. And one of the most important things about it was that it was um, not a centralized system. It was peer-to-peer. -peer. It had to be super fast, which meant that he could connect to another repository somewhere else in non-centralized location and move code back and forth between it in a really efficient and powerful way. So the two camps, um, I'm going to, like I said, simplify the argument that Drupal's been having about this, are sort of simplified down into two different camps. The first one is camp keep, what I'm calling camp keep it simple. So camp keep it simple is the first um, version. I would venture to guess that like 90% of all Drupal projects that have, uh, you know, that are using Git are probably using this approach. They put their Git repo in their Drupal root. They're tracking almost everything in there. Um, everything except for, you know, a settings PHP file, maybe your actual site files. This approach has a ton of good stuff going for it. So first and foremost, it's really, really simple, okay? This is probably the most intuitive thing. It's the thing that people think about when they're like, starting up a project, where am I gonna put my repo? Okay, they're gonna put it in the site root. root. So that's really simple, simple approach. It comes with a lot of benefits. And one of the great benefits is that it makes DevOps really easy. So moving your code from one environment to another is really simple because it's all right there in that one repository. You have minimal additional setup for each, each subsequent environment. And one of the, um, as a part of that, um, or a component to that, is that when you're working on a team of people, a team of developers, it makes it really easy to share changes, to track, to work with each other, to make sure that everyone's working off of the same code. And then lastly, a uh, sort of side benefit is that when you're tracking everything in one repository like this and you do have other environments set up, and a change happens in one of those environments, you are tracking it so that you can debug it and figure out what if a file has changed that's causing maybe the problem that you're seeing. Now, to introduce the other camp, as I'm putting it, um, I first need to reference a um, post that James Walker wrote back all the way back in 2011. In it, he sort of introduced a um, probing question. Um, he had done a lot of work with install profiles in the past and going all the way back to very early versions of Drupal and had always liked them, and the reason why is because he felt like an install profile can actually perfectly encapsulate what it is to be a Drupal site. So he writes this post called, said, saying every Drupal site is an install profile. And what he means by that is it is an install profile because an install profile can hold and contain everything that makes up an individual Drupal site. And if we think about that question, what makes up an individual Drupal site is usually a theme, um, some custom code, usually inside of modules, and a list of libraries and contrib modules. Note I say a list, it's not even actual contrib modules. That's not unique, what's unique is just the list to that site. So this post um, inspired me and many other developers to begin, got the wheels turning, got us thinking about this a little bit. So the other side of the argument is what I'm calling camp only what you need. So this camp says, okay, an install profile can be used as a container for an individual Drupal site. So we should put our Git repo in that install profile and only track what's in that install profile. It's only what you need because it's not tracking a whole bunch of other stuff that is not unique to that Drupal site. So this approach has its own set of unique benefits. Um, it's more efficient. There's less code to track, which puts less of a load on Git. Now, Git's so, Git's so fast that you don't actually, that's not really that relevant. It's not that important. But it's not just that it's less. It's that what you're putting in this repository is going to be more semantic than what you're putting in your other repository because this repository is the stuff you're interested in. This is the stuff that's different about this site than any other site. Whereas when you're using the other approach, it won't always be that way. Now, it also comes with the benefit that you can set up a structure so that you can have other repositories. So let's say a custom module and it can have its own repository. Using this structure, we actually have a framework where we can incorporate that sort of change. So just to go over some of the basics um, here, this is what an install profile look, might look like, okay? So an install profile looks a lot like um, an individual site, a directory, um, but it also looks a little bit like a module. So inside of a sample install profile, you're gonna have a directory for your modules, a directory for your themes, probably a directory for your libraries, although not shown here, 
and in this case, a directory for patches. Um, and then you're going to have an info file. You're going to have a dot profile file, which is essentially the same thing as a dot module file if you're creating a custom module. And then it, you would likely want to have a dot install file, which is the same as you would use an install file in a module. There's two other files in here that make an install profile and install profile, and those are these two dot make files. Um, you won't always see two, but you're likely to see a dot make file. And that's because you have to have a separate process when you're using an install profile architecture to run site builds. And you use those make files. So what's important about looking at install profile is specifically what's not in that repository. So you see here, Drupal core is not in that repository. We don't need to track it. Your libraries are most likely not going to be in that repository unless for some strange reason you're developing your own library in that project, which is probably poor practice anyway. And your contrib, your actual contrib modules are going to be excluded via a git ignore that you'll set up um, from that because you don't need to track that code. You don't need to track those contrib modules. You just need to track the list of contrib modules. As I mentioned, this is because you have to run a build process. So those make files are build files. And a build file is essentially just a configuration file. In the configuration file, you set up a list of what you want to be built out when you run the build. So this uh, first one is an example of uh, what would be called maybe the profile build file. And it's very simple. It, all it has is in, in it is it lists the vo version of Drupal core. And then it's going to list the actual profile, which is your container for your site, um, secondly. secondly. So you, you, there are many different build tools, but the one I'm going to talk about today is called Drush Make. Um, can I just get a show of hands for everyone who is familiar with Drush Make and has used it before? OK, good. So that's most of the people. So example Drush Make command, you would build the file, and then um, you would pass it the parameter where you want that file to be built. This is the other build file um, that was in a sample install profile. So this is a drupal-org.make. Um, the name of that's very specific, and it's specific because Drush Make in the internals, it recurses um, through all the projects that it builds out. So when you define one project, it builds it, retrieves that project, and then it'll traverse the directories and the files in that project looking for any files named drupal-org.make or the name of the project.make. And when it finds those, it then tries to build those files too. So when you run build on the first file, it's Josh Mink's actually going to pick up this file as well and parse this and then attempt to operate on it. So you see here, this is um, defining out the items that are going to be unique to the site. We have a list of contrib modules, uh, admin menu, libraries, path auto. Um, these, we don't actually have to specify very much to them um, because it knows to go look, at the, look for them on drupal.org and then it will actually download a tarball and it will unarchive that. Down below we have a custom module. This custom module, if you pay attention to the download type, we can actually specify uh, git as the download type, pass it the URL to our repository, and give it a ref, in this case a branch name. And what it'll do is it'll actually clone that repository as its uh, default technique for pulling in that code. So immediately when you think about using the install profile approach for your Git repository and setting up your site as a, using that as a container, you immediately have to think about builds because builds are a component part of setting, some, setting things up that way. So the first thing that you probably think of is, okay, well now we have to introduce a build process to our development process. And that process might look something similar to this. So you download your make file um, from your repo, your remote repo. You would run the build using Drush Make in this case. Um, you would perform your development just like you would ordinarily, with the caveat that you would have to understand where that development needs to take place. Um, so it would be in your install profile rather than in the sites directory. You'd follow whatever your Git flow is that you work with to incorporate your changes, get them merged. And then when you suspect that there's upstream changes, um, you would have to run a new build. So this process on the face of it isn't um, much to talk about. In fact, I think this is probably similar to what a lot of developers in other languages and other frameworks end up doing because of the nature of that technology. So this is, this is the problem space. This is the conversation that's been happening. You have two different camps in the Drupal community. The first one is camp keep it simple. I'm labeling them the pragmatists. They want things to be simple. They don't want any additional headaches, and they feel like this does the job well. 
The other is Camp Only What You Need. They're, um, I'm labeling them the purists. So they are the engineers and the architects who really like the fact that they, they actually, they don't like the fact that in the other model you end up tracking a bunch of stuff that you're never actually concerned with. That irritates them. So they're usually very uh, taken to the other approach because it's really paring it down to only what you're concerned about. Now we talked about the benefits of these. They both have some significant drawbacks. So with camp only what you need, um, you have to run builds. This is actually a really significant drawback. Um, it introduces complexity into your development process if it's a part of your development process. And, um, and that complexity can be enough to actually give you reason not to use it. Camp keep it simple on the flip side. Despite its simplicity, it actually can undermine our own development efforts. Drupal itself is a modular architecture. It's based on the idea of having component parts that you can build independently and reuse them elsewhere. When you put your Git repo in the site root like that and you're doing your development, um, assume that this is a site of sufficient complexity that you have custom modules. Assume that some of these custom modules are actually significant, that they take you some time to develop, develop and they're one, not just one-offs. Well, those modules that you're developing then are stuck in that history of that parent. Now, you can get around this, and um, the way that you would do that is you would just throw your Git repo for your particular custom module that you're developing and doing significant effort on inside wherever that resides, so in your modules directory of your site, and throw that Git repo in there. And then if you do that, you're effectively using Git submodules. So real quick, does anyone really love Git submodules? and or get subtrees and, okay, does anyone use them? Does anyone love them? All right, all right, so we got a couple, two, three people. So for you all, you may have contention with some of the things I'm saying. I'm not gonna go into either get sub, get sub modules or get subtrees. Um, it's enough for me to say that I um, don't think that they're a viable strategy for development across the board. I think that they can work really well for people who understand them really well. And I think that actually means that for a lot of people working on teams where you can't um, expect that your team members are going to have a certain level of expertise, it's not really an option um, for architecting your site. So get some modules and get sub trees are, I think, prohibitive tools. And that presents a huge, huge problem because I think it undermines our ability to develop really well using this model. So what really is the difference between these two? Well, if we talk size, um, I took a recent project and did a quick rough, um, S, uh, ran some analytics to do a, a quick rough comparison. So I had one project, the same code base, and I had to get repository located in the site root, and I looked at how many files there were and how many lines of code, and then I did the same for the same project, the same code base, but with the git repository in the install profile. And you see here that there are over 9,000 fewer files, over one million fewer lines of code, accumulating into a 93% difference. So this is significant. Now you might say it doesn't matter. Um, I would suggest that a smaller code base likely means a little bit less complexity. It likely means a more maintainable code base, but that's definitely not a rule. I think more important for me is the semantics of what's tracked in the Git history. So when you have the smaller code base and you're only tracking what's unique to that site, when you um, commit a change, so let's say you're updating a module, the difference is that you're changing a, get, a make file, you're changing the version number, which to me is semantically sound to what you're actually doing there. The alternative is you're updating the module, you're actually updating the files, and those files, the changes in those files get tracked in your history, which isn't true to what you're actually doing there. So I said camp only what you need. I'm labeling them the purists. The benefits of the purists is that you have an opportunity for everything to have a place and for everything to be in its right place. The big gain here, the big win, and the one single thing, if you don't take anything else away from this session that I hope you take away, is that this allows you to develop with reusable components. And reusable components are really, really important. That's what Drupal is from the ground up, and that's it's really important for us to be able to use that same approach in our own development. So the ability to write a custom module that you can reuse with, let's say, the same client on another site, the ability to write a custom module that you can reuse across all of your clients and all your projects, 
perhaps most importantly, the ability to write a custom module that you can easily contribute back to the community. I actually would argue that because the way that we have been setting up our repositories in most of our projects, we have less contribution back to the community because there are so many custom modules, so many lost ideas that get stuck down in individual projects. So how many of you have been developing and you're writing a custom module and you knew that it could be abstract, it could be reusable, you could use it later. You maybe even wrote it that way. You maybe even took great pains to write it that way. But you had your project set up the other way so that the Git repository was in the Drupal root. And so all of your commits and all of your changes were tracked in the overall project history. And you never actually got back to move, going back in there, grabbing that module out, rescuing it from the depths of that project and reusing it. How many have had that happen to them? So how many of you have actually gotten over that problem and gone and grabbed that code, and then you've started a new repository, and you've been really frustrated by the fact that you did a ton of work on that module, but the history of that, the Git history, is all wrapped up, the change history is wrapped up in the larger project, and now you have like a new repo, and you have like a single commit that says, okay, ah, here's my module. How many of you have had that situation? So that's irritating, and it's not good design. And ideally, we shouldn't be doing things that way. So the way that we set up our projects, I think, is really important. I do not think that this is a trivial distinction. So some would argue that this is bike shedding, that this is going through and saying that these, um, this is just a subtle change. It doesn't really matter one way or the other. I think that it's really important because I think that when we set up certain structures, any structure actually, when you have any architecture, it influences the way that we do things. So setting up, uh, having an architecture, it bias, uh, biases us in a certain direction. It sets defaults for how we do things. And I think that nudges the way that we end up developing. And I think that is really important. When you set up things with using an install profile as the container for your site, you end up having to think about context. You actually enforce, by that simple distinction, you already immediately enforce your developers to think about context. They have to think about whether or not what they're developing fits inside of the current site that they're building or if it's more generic than that. That subtle distinction is really important. I was in a situation where I was working with a team of developers on a project and we had this sort of can't keep it simple approach, okay? We had one project that was like that. We made the decision to switch to another approach. And immediately, when I was in the position of project lead and I was working with other developers, new conversations started to happen that had never happened before with them. It usually was like, here is a JIRA task, here's the issue, here's the feature that the, the client needs, you need to build this type of module, and I think that you should build this in a reusable way because we may find use for it later. That was what I would tell them. And what ha happened immediately when we switched this architecture is those questions started to come at me. They came flying at me from the developers themselves saying, listen, um, I know that this module and this feature is, this, is such and such, and I think actually we could maybe use this. Should I build it this way so that it's actually in its own repository so that we can reuse it later? I think that's an important distinction because it proves to me that developers then was thinking in a different way than we were previously. And if you can't tell, I think <laughs> in general that the install profile as a container is the way to go. I prefer it and I think it's a better approach. But I know probably half of you in here are saying, hold on a second, let's not just gloss over all the negatives. And there are some really significant negatives. The build process itself is hellish. Um, for those of you, uh, which was most of you, have used Drush Make before, um, it's not, an, it's not a very simple tool to use. In fact, it has a ton of configurations and flags. Um, and it also, at least uh, in a lot of developers' experience, is quite buggy. Um, you get inconsistent results when you run it different ways. And it takes a certain on-ramping to get up to speed where you're really comfortable using it. So at minimum, it introduces this build process, introduces extra steps. It introduces extra time because of the extra steps, but also because Drush Make, oftentimes, when you have sufficiently sized site, actually takes a while to run. It takes a while to run, in part because it can be a processor intensive process, so depending on the resources, that can be prohibitive as well. It's also inherently flaky. So how many of you have run Drush Make, and it was a significantly sized site, and you were running the build, and the build takes like seven, eight, ten minutes, and you ran that build, and you thought everything was fine, but some site from some library that you were trying to download was down at the time, 
So it didn't download that, and it failed, and you lost all the complete, completely lost the build, and you had to start all over. How many have been in that situation? Yes, yeah, so that's yeah, that's not a good one. So it's inherently flaky because it has to go out. It is going out for you and downloading all these resources from all these different places that you've defined in your, in your build files. If any of those is not available, it's going to fail. Now, there are flags using Drush Make. You can prevent it from failing completely, so you have, a ha you have the result of what it's actually retrieved. But the point is that it is an inherently flaky process. That makes it difficult. Drush Make and running builds using Drush Make is actually hard to learn. I've learned this by experience, by picking it up myself, figuring it out, then trying to teach others, and having to listen to all the ways in which it's really difficult and hard for them to incorporate into their development, into their flows, and even just understanding pr basic principles about what a build is, why we need to run it, and what it's doing for us, and why that could be a benefit. It introduces a significant team dilemma. Part of that's because it's hard to learn, a big part of it. So if you have a new developer or a junior developer coming onto a team and you're trying to get them up to speed and they're not used to this, they haven't ever developed like this before, and you need you know, them to be developing and producing results rapidly, uh, you may find that this actually is a big, big barrier to that. Um, I've been in a situation just like this where it created a huge headache. But it's not just new and junior developers. If you're working on a team where you actually have a division of roles, let's say you have a themer that comes on to do your theme work, themer comes on at some point in the project, and now they have to get up to speed with this whole build process, which is something that for a themer skill set, someone who's dedicated to theming, is not in their wheelhouse, and that can make it even more prohibitive for them. I've also been in that situation. And lastly, it creates a significant DevOps headache. Because you're not tracking all your files, moving those files and moving that code from environment to environment isn't so easy anymore. Um, at minimum, you're going to have to run builds in each environment that you want that code to exist on. Um, when you think about development environments, your working environments, it might not be a problem. When you think about running that on a production server, I, um, I don't know, maybe there are good flows that make that work, but for me, I know I could never stomach um, doing that because of its inherent lack of reliability. So the big question I have, and the big question that I challenge you all is, can we be pragmatic purists? Can we take the best of both of these worlds? So can we take the benefits, the pros, from the simpler pragmatic approach and the benefits from the more pure architecturally sound approach and come out with something where we benefit across the board? The answer is yes. I tell you, it's yes. So this, there's an animation running, so you can just loosely pay attention to it. I'll walk through it in a second. The way that we can make this happen, the way we can be pragmatic purists, is by separating out the build process from the development process. So the flow diagram I showed before is a red herring. Um, when you include the build process into the development process, it's not solving the problem. Again, it can solve the problem for the developer who understands Drush Make in and out, who understands the build process in and out, who knows how to run targeted builds, who knows how to work with it. That's fine. But most often, for most of us, we're not isolated and we're working with lots of other people and we want to be working with lots of other people. And for those situations, it's not really viable. So if we separate out the build process from the development process, and the reason this relates to DevOps, because in my mind, the build process is a DevOps process. So this here is an animation uh, showing roughly the time. It's sped up probably two, two and a half times. But it's roughly the time it takes for me, in this case, to go in, make a change to a make file where I, wanna, I want to pull in a new custom module. So I add that custom module to the make file, commit that change. I push that up to the server. The server magically triggers, in this case, a build server. Imagine a build server. At this step where it's at right now, an automated build is running for me on the build server. It takes a little while. When it's complete, let's say I have Jenkins set up. I you know, have the UI for Jenkins. I know it's complete. So then I know I can pull down my latest changes. So I'm able to pull those changes back down from the build server, which is running the build for me. I never have to run a build locally. And when we get through to the last step, you'll see it's just showing the new custom module that was downloaded. So yes, I think it's possible to do this. And I'm going to walk you through how I think it's possible. The problem before was this, I think, is the wrong approach. When you just incorporate builds into the dev process, it doesn't end up working out. There's huge complications. 
If we simply separate them, this is nothing more than a conceptual shift, okay, that has real-world ramifications, but a conceptual shift. If we separate them and we say, okay, development process is development process, the build process is dedicated to a DevOps component, a separate process. This allows us to be able to have a situation where your developers then don't necessarily always have to understand the build process and know how to run it themselves. So on the left, you have the dev process. It looks very ordinary. You develop just like you normally would in user Git flow. On the right, in this case, like I just illustrated in that animation, you have, uh, think about having a build server, the idea of a build server. That build server downloads the make file, runs the build, and then let's say it serves up the build as a result in a vhost on that server in, call it your dev environment, your test environment, whatever. So you've developed, you've pushed it up, that triggered a build, and now you have a new environment that's built for you that you can go and test and look at, okay? Just by making this simple conceptual divide, we already knock off the top four items um, from the problems, the hellish experience of running builds. So these are all sort of the system level problems, the additional steps, the, the time it takes to run them, how intensive the processor is and how inherently flaky it can be, just because we're saying, okay, let's outsource this problem to an automated build process on a dev server, okay? That simple conceptual shift. It doesn't actually address how hard it is to learn this whole approach and the architecture behind it, the team dilemma and the DevOps headaches. It doesn't address those at all. For instance, in this previous example on the left, um, this is overly simplistic, right? The developer is developing, they're pushing the changes, and then the build's running, and then you have this test environment, but then the developer's local environment is not necessarily in sync with what's up on the test environment. So I'm here to suggest we add an additional layer in here to add a little complexity make the DevOps process a little bit more robust, which can open up doors to helping us solve this problem and get the best of both worlds. And I'm going to introduce this in part based on what I was saying earlier about the nature of Git. The reason why I think this is a viable strategy is because Git has these dual functions. I was introducing these concepts to a friend of mine, a developer friend of mine who is wiser than I and more experienced, and he was wondering why the heck I wanted to do this, why I wanted to use Git in this way. And I told him it's because of the fact that Git inherently is a good tool for moving code around from environment to environment. So I'm going to separate out on two different slides now, the dev and the DevOps side. This is the DevOps side. I'm going to say, let's say a build is triggered. Somehow we have a trigger set up. Let's say you push code and that triggered a build on, the dev, on, the, on a separate server, on a separate environment, on a build server. The build's triggered. It downloads the make file. It runs the build. And then, critically, it takes the result of that build, commits it to a brand new repository that has no relation to the other repositories you're using. It's one off, sort of. Uh, this repository I'm gonna call the builds repo. It only has the complete result of the build. And then from there you can deploy by just pulling from that repo. So you deploy that vhost for your test environment, but also you can imagine that you can deploy anywhere else as well. If we do that, then our development process is also ironed out. So we can develop just like we normally would, use whatever your Git flow is. If you detect there are upstream changes, you can then just pull the latest build down from that build's repo that you've committed the result of the build on the build server with. Okay, so we're just adding one little component. It shifts the whole game. Now, upstream changes when you're working in this sort of install profile as a container and running builds and having make files, it's not actually as simple as you ordinarily would have upstream changes and wondering about whether or not they're upstream changes and checking to see if they're upstream, upstream changes because of the fact that Joshua make recurses, so you don't actually know necessarily if a new version of a module was introduced somewhere down the chain, so it becomes a little bit more difficult. So if we do this, there's the potential to eliminate all of the building problems. In one sense, we outsource them to this concept of a build server, but we also introduce benefits to the rest of the process, okay? So we solve the DevOps headache by actually committing the result of the build to its separate repo that we can then deploy from. We, at the same time, can solve the development headaches by being able to pull those changes down to your working environment and work from the result of the builds. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do a deep dive and get into the actual code of what this might look like.
All right, so there are six, rough six steps here, and I'm mostly focusing on the builds, uh, the DevOps component of this. So the, this notion of setting up a build server, it wouldn't actually have to be a separate server. You could do this locally. The first step is to set up the build server directory structure. Uh, one big, big caveat, there are a million ways to do this. Like most of the things that are good, this started as a series of bash scripts. This was reflection of choices I made. You could do this any number of ways, so just keep that in mind. If you end up liking this approach, you want to implement it down the line, but it doesn't quite fit your use case and how you want to do things, no problem, just alter it to fit. So let's say you have the vhost section of your server. In that vhost section, you're going to have a container directory here that I'm calling your site. Inside that, you're going to have actually the directory that is your, your vhost for an environment. Um, in that directory, you're going to end up having an actual Drupal install, and it's going to have a Git repo in it. You're also going to have a build directory, which is going to have a Git repo in it. And lastly, you're going to have a third directory for the builds repo. The builds repo is going to have a headless Git repository in it. This step in particular, when I just mentioned that caveat, having the headless repo on your server, absolutely not necessary. You could set it up as a, a GitHub repository or whatever tool you use to manage your code. You could put it wherever you want. In this case, for me, it was um, not something that needed to be have the extra tools around uh, being more visible and the extra, extra workflow type tools that GitHub provides. So um, it made more sense to just have it be sitting on the server as a headless repo. Is headless repo, how many, everyone familiar with the headless repo? More or less? How, who's not? Anyone brave enough? Okay. Okay, good. So I'll explain it. Okay. So, so you normally have your Git repository. If you've ever paid attention to what Git, when you run Git init, for instance, if you pay attention to what happens when you do that, it actually sticks a directory, a hidden directory in wherever you ran it um, called .git. That .git is where it stores, all the magic happens in there. That's where it's storing all of the changes that it's tracking for you. Okay, when you create, um, and, and that allows you, because it's a hidden directory inside the directory, that allows you to track your files, your actual working files. When you create a headless repository, you're saying, I don't need to track any working files. All I want is the Git component of it. So this is a technique that you can use if you're trying to set up, for instance, your own remote that you're going to bounce off of back and forth. It's like a poor man's GitHub, you might consider it. Um, and there's other tools that actually take off this idea and build tools around it so you don't have to use GitHub, and a lot of people probably use those. So when you look inside, when you set up a headless repository, you look inside it, all you see is the system, the Git system files in there. You don't actually have a working directory to track changes. All right, so the the first step here, all we have, these are just make dir. So just create these three empty directories is all it is. So the first step is inside the builds repo directory, we're going to create that headless repo. You do that by just attaching this flag, um, dash dash bear, get in it dash dash bear. That sets up your headless repository. Now we're going to shift into our build directory. We're going to initialize a new repository there. We're going to create a git ignore. You could just copy this from any other site that you have a git ignore in your, your Drupal root um, or use whatever git ignore you want there. So we're going to create a git ignore, add it, commit it as the initial commit to the repository. Um, git branch dash m, that just changes um, the default master branch to a branch name that we want to use. Totally optional here. Um, 7.x dash 1.x dash builds. We're going to add a remote. The remote we're going to add is actually to that headless repository we just created. So on the same server in this case, you're just going to pass in the path to that directory. And then we're going to push this one commit with this git ignore file to that headless repository. So now the builds directory has a single commit, and the uh, remote headless repository has a single commit. We're going to go into the vhost directory. We're going to initialize a repository there as well. These are all setup steps, mind you. We're going to add a remote to the headless repository. We're going to pull down that commit that we just made on that headless. And then we're just going to, for convenience sake, change the branch name again to that branch that we want to use. Uh, by default, it would be master. So these are sort of infrastructural steps. Then we'll get to the point of where the magic happens. We're going to run our first build. Um, roughly speaking, these steps could look however you want, but you would download the, the build file, which you probably want to store in your repository um, for your install profile. And we're going to actually just destroy the build directory that we just created, um, because one of the things that Drush Make does is it requires that in order to build a site from Drupal root down, it can't have an existing directory already there. Um, if anyone knows more about Drush Make um, or like 
has, if anyone else has had this problem or knows more about it than I do, I would love to talk after, um, because this simple fact actually um, is sort of uh, gets the ball rolling for a bunch of other workarounds that I end up having to do uh, with all of this stuff. So I'm going to remove that build directory, run your Josh make into a directory called build, which is the same name of the directory that we just removed. If Josh make is successful, it will successfully build out the entire site, um, including all of Drupal core files and your entire site structure. Then the really difficult part comes where we're going to try to take the result of that build and we're going to commit it to the builds repository. So this first step, um, uh, you don't really need to understand what the first command does here, but uh, technically, but essentially what it's doing is it's removing any lingering git ignore files that may be in the, the result of the build. So that new build is going to remove any git ignore files, and that's there because um, Drushmake has a flag called working copy that you can run, and when you run working copy, it'll actually clone, it, it by default does this to download the files. It'll clone the files if you define in your make files a git repository. It'll actually use like git clone to clone those, and that'll clone the repository. Normally, if you don't have the working copy flag, it'll delete that directory and it'll delete that repository. But if you do have the working copy, it'll leave that there. What it doesn't touch is the git ignore files, and git actually does deal with git ignore files that aren't in the root where the git, uh, where the git directory actually is. So it'll actually affect your results of what you're able to track. So the first step, remove all those git ignore files. They're just going to cause a headache. We're going to initialize a repository now because we've built out a new build it doesn't have any Git information. It doesn't have any Git repository in it. We're not using working copy in this case. So we initialize a new repository. We add the remote back to the builds repo. We're going to fetch from that builds repo, and we're going to check out the Git ignore file. The new result of the build doesn't have a Git ignore file in it. We're going to grab that Git ignore file that we committed earlier. We're going to add all, everything. So the result of the build, including the Git ignore file. Um, ta the tag command there just is creating a timestamp that we can use in our commit message. Again, this is, this is I guess, this is bash, so uh, just you can translate these steps into whatever language you're more comfortable thinking. So we're going to commit that re result, um, and then we're going to go ahead and check out the branch that we set up initially, okay? This is where things get really hairy. We're going to check out that branch, and then what we're going to do is going to cherry pick the commit that we just made on the master branch so that it gets added on top of the git history for this other branch that we're actually using. That branch is what we want there is a linear history of every build that's run. So there's going to be a commit for every single build, and we want that to be a linear history. Um, I used to have this set up so that it was using a mer uh, merge strategy that was creating um, this git history that if you visualize the git history, it was an endlessly recursive branch of commits because it was actually creating merge commits and a bunch of other headaches. Um, by using uh, cherry pick, we're just grabbing that commit and um, we have to use a special merge strategy here, otherwise it creates problems. For anyone in the audience who may be an expert in Git, more so than myself, I would love to talk after as well. Um, I actually currently have a, um, a bug where I found a workaround over the last few days um, with this. In some cases, the merge strategy uh, subtree works for this. In other cases, it doesn't. And for those cases, I end up using a recursive merge strategy with the strategy option of theirs. Um, but there's, I think there's probably a better way to do this. If you're wondering why you wouldn't do a merge or a rebase here, it's because these two different branches don't have any common history because we're sort of like doing something that Git isn't really set up to do. It doesn't like this. Um, because we're saying we're going to initialize repository, and I'm just saying I want to take whatever is in that build and I want to commit it on top of another branch. But they have no common history. The first, the new build doesn't have any history at all. So I had to do a lot of backflips to get around this. And then we're going to um, push the result once that's committed. We're going to push it to the, the build's repo, the headless repo. And then we're going to, we can then at that point deploy this to our vhost. If you want to have a vhost on your environment and you want to run that build, you can see now how simple the deployment process becomes because it's just a repository. So we're just going to fetch from the builds repo and reset to the latest commit on that branch. So just to take a step back from the code and visualize this again, this is what the flow is. The build's triggered, make files downloaded, run the build, commit the build result to the separate builds repo, and then we can deploy from there. And the last step of this process is undefined here, but you would want to set up something automated to trigger your builds. So it might just be a nightly build that you run. Um, you may want it to pick up on pull requests that are submitted or merges or commits or whatever you want to do. Um, 
for it to either pull or monitor your activity to run, have that trigger builds. And then also the process of this code, where that code gets run and how it's organized is, um, is you know, it's up to you. It could be done in any, any different way. Like I mentioned, this originally was a series, this originally was just writing down steps that I was doing manually. And I did that a few times. And then I wrote down the steps in bash so that then I had scripts and lastly, this could also be um, Josh commands. So I've worked about, um, for about the last month on this. So taking those bash scripts and converting them to actual Josh commands. Um, if this um, way of doing things might end up being interesting to you, I definitely encourage you to take a look at the work that I've been doing. It could actually save you um, all of the effort because I know that some of this stuff probably looks um, a bit hairy. So I created a utility called Drush get ops. Um, it has four commands right now. Um, this is really a proof of concept, but I will tell you that these concepts and this way of structuring things is not a proof of concept. So this has been employed um, on a, lar a number of lar very large scale um, Drupal sites um, successfully. This also has helped with the problem of being able to architect code the way we wanted to and still be able to deploy to Pantheon and Acquia who wouldn't support running a build on their environment. So you actually have to pass them your code. They want that to happen through a repository, ideally. So this actually solved that headache by saying, OK, let's still develop the way we want to. Then we can have a build process, a build repo, and we can just use the builds repo for our DevOps in terms of deployment. So there are four commands. There's an init command, a build command. Those are the, the sort of uh, infrastructure commands. Those are the steps that I just walked through all the code of. And then in the working environment, and this is the newer work that I've been doing that's um, less tested, um, is more for developers to use in their working environment, whether it be local or somewhere else. Um, there's a clone command and a pull command. Um, I am going to try to be brave here. We have a little bit of time and do a real demo. Um, I know that it's not a good idea, but let's see how it goes. And I, I figure it's like a reward for it being the afternoon, you guys sticking around with me, you get to experience the suspense. Okay, so let me see if I'm still logged in. Okay, so let's see. How is it? All right, so bear with me. Let's see, I can make it a little bigger. Okay, so hopefully you can see um, that fairly well. Okay, so what I'm, I'm on what we might call my build server right now. Um, right now I'm actually in the, like a, my site, right? My, in the vhost section of my build server. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run um, those Drush commands. So the first one is I'm going to run, uh, in here you can see the, what's in this directory. It just has a logs directory and some backups and then a public directory. The public directory is actually my vhost site root. So I'm going to run um, the git ops init command first. The git ops init command just sets up that directory structure and does that first setup step where it's creating the headless repo and the other repos. So when I do that, now you can look at the contents of this directory. You see there's the public, but there's now there's also the public build and the public builds repo directories. If we look inside each one of these, we'll find a git repo. Um, so you see in there we have our git ignore file that we set up, and we have a git repo inside of that build directory. This build directory is a throwaway anyway. We're going to end up getting rid of that um, and replacing it every time we run a build. Um, inside of the... Um, builds repo directory, you can see, for those of you not familiar with a headless repo, this is what it would look like, the contents of the headless repo. This is how it's different. You see just the git specific files um, in there. And lastly, in our vhost, um, we can see the same thing. It's actually going to look exactly the same as the build directory. So we have our git ignore and our git file. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to run, this is the step that might fail due to connection and everything else. We're going to run the git ops build command. Um, don't pay too much attention to all, I'm passing a bunch of flags. Um, essentially what I'm doing is I'm gonna download a, the build file from GitHub and I'm using a strategy that's not necessary in this case because it's actually a public repo, but if it were a private repo, um, you have to use the API in order to be able to actually grab that file and that's the purpose of all this. You'll also notice that I have a GitHub token in here which I'm gonna change immediately after this, so if you can hack me somehow using that token between now and then, props to you. Wrong directory. Okay, so 
That initialized the build. It's actually running, it's using Drush Make right now to run the build. Um, this may take a second. Um, it's just a minimal in, uh, install profile, so uh, if it does start working, it shouldn't take long. Yeah, so the question is, uh, where is the make file? Wouldn't it be in the public directory? Um, isn't it part of the install prof profile? So yes, it is. That's, it is in my public directory in this case, and it's just sitting in, it's wherever you want to put it, but in my case, I like to put it in my, my install profile. So yeah, I'm downloading it from there, um, just the individual file, because that's all we need to initialize the, the, the build. Does that make sense? There wasn't, because that's just the initialization step. In the um, git ops build command, I'm downloading the file as part of that. Just from, from, uh, from, git, from, yeah, from GitHub in this case. Okay. So I download the file from GitHub, dumping it into a temporary directory, and then running drush make on that file. Okay, so it's, it's completed this process. So it's done the full build, and if we just ls, we're in the public directory, this is my vhost. You can see Drupal core here. Um, if I do, um, if I look at my git history now, you'll see that I have the initial commit, which is part of the setup process. I now have another commit that has, says build and then it has a timestamp. That's the result of this first build that I just ran. So if I go back up and I look at um, the public build directory, which is redundant at this point because it'll roughly match what's in the other one. Gotcha, gotcha. Of course, the connection would crap out right now. <laughs> All right, so this roughly matches what is in the vhost directory. All right, so that's um, that's it really for this process to work on the, to have the build server set up. That the git ops init is a one-time command you need to run to just set up the structure. Um, and then the build command is something that you would actually have like your Jenkins task, for instance, running for you whenever a build was triggered, okay? Um, right now, that, that command is making a lot of assumptions about how you want to do things. There are some flags and parameters you can pass it, but we could add more. Um, if, if anyone is interested in this, we can definitely make it more robust. Okay, so I'm going to flip back over to local and show you the other two commands. So I'm just sitting in a directory, let's say my working directory on my local site. I am a themer. I come onto the project. I don't have anything set up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the GitOps clone command first. I'm going to end up passing it where exactly that builds repo is in terms of the remote. I run that, it's going to clone um, that builds repo, and then it's going to do some, uh, some magic stuff, some really important stuff. So it's going to clone that repository, but it's not just git clone, otherwise we could just run git clone. Some of the output here is because I'm still debugging, so I apologize for that, but what it does is it's going to create, um, uh, I gave it barefoot clone, that's what I called the Directory, okay, so what we see here is we have Drupal root, okay? If I look at hidden files, you'll see there's no um, git repository here, okay? So if I did just git clone, it would have pulled that down, it would have cloned that repository, it would have been a git, git, there would have been a git repo there. It doesn't have one because this command is a wrapper so that I can go in and I use the same, I uh, just extend classes that are already in Drush Make to recursively search through the project files and look for any make well, actually, I pass it the make file, but then from that make file, I recursively go through all the projects. And I look for any projects that specify git as the download method in the make file. And then what I do is I get rid of the git repo that would have been in the site root, and I initialize those other repos with the appropriate remote pointing back to whatever you'd find in the make file. So that's um, a little bit complicated to understand, but I'll illustrate it here shortly. Okay, so I now, you can see here, I have a repo here. Um, so my, this command actually found that the install profile itself is using the git strategy for downloading a repo. It goes in there, it sets up that git repo, and you can see now I have my install profile git repo set up for me. I didn't even have to think about it. Importantly, you can also do this for, um, let's see if I still have this. So the important part is it's not just for the install profile, but if you have other custom modules that you're building and they have their own Git history, it's going to find those as well and set up those repositories. So here I am in a custom module that's in this project. It has its own 
um, repository here as well. And it was set up for me. Okay, so that covers initializing the project. You're the themer, you pull it down. Okay, now let's say you're the themer, you make the changes, you push, you commit those changes. Um, rather than, for the sake of time, I won't actually do that to illustrate the full power, but um, after you had pushed your changes to the specific project that you're working on, so that might be the install profile itself, but it might be a custom module, a custom theme that's actually broken out in its own repository. You push those changes, those changes get merged, and then you have the problem where your local may not be up to date with um, the latest state of the code base, especially if you're working on a team and there's a lot of moving parts, or especially if you haven't actually, you know, been in this code for a week or something, it's a safe bet you want to refresh um, up from upstream. So the third, the last command is um, running the git op, git opt pull command. Um, and actually, I need to make sure I'm in the right directory. Okay, so okay, so GitOps pull is going to do roughly the same thing as clone. It's just going to pull down the changes um, using git pull instead, but it's going to do the same stuff where it takes the repository is actually using to pull those from. It actually initializes it first in the root of the site. It then pulls. It then deletes it. It goes through recursively, checks any of the project individual projects, and sets up the repos there. So I just want to wrap up by saying that I think that DevOps is absolutely critical to how we develop, to the nature of it, and I hope you think more about that. And if you do, I hope you come away saying, where is your repo is not really the right question. The right question is where are all of your repos because you set up a DevOps flow before you even got started developing and thus efficiently made use of reusable components without having to sacrifice on your ability to deploy your sites from one environment to another. Thank you. So please evaluate this session uh, if you can take the time. Uh, I'm an independent contractor. I am currently available for work, so I'd love to have a conversation about what your needs are and if I can help with them. Um, there's contact information at the bottom there is the uh, repository where I have this utility, the Drush GitOps. Will your slides be on the uh, GitHub? My slides are already up on my session page, so we're good there. Thank you. We have like three minutes, so if anyone has quick questions, and head to the mic. Go ahead. So I actually have a comment more than a question. Yeah. Um, we use this workflow with where I work, which is new media. Um, we also use Vagrant for local development. So using Vagrant um, with our Drupal recipe, which is the chef recipe, uh, you can do Drush make install profiles. And it's really simple. It'll do auto templating in chef for you. Um, and the second thing is, is I think we should propose this as a common dev flow for the community. That way, while onboarding people from shop to shop, um, they understand DrushMake. They start with DrushMake. I mean, D.O uses DrushMake. You pull down commerce, that's using DrushMake. So, like, I think the community should accept this and adopt it as a standard dev process more than just... Um, like, oh yeah, this shop does it too. Yeah, well, I applaud that. I think that's a great suggestion. And the fir to the first, I think that's awesome, uh, and I'd love to see more, learn more about it, because it save a lot of work. Any other questions?